Oh, it's very bright, isn't it? It is. Yeah, <laughs> blinding. Um, good, e uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Pori Cusack, and I'm the creative producer on Our Generation. And I think you all know Daniel Evans, um, your artistic director, but also director of um, Our Generation, which we're going to talk about now. Um, it's quite hard to see you all, but can I just ask, has anyone yet seen the show? So a few of you have. Oh, quite a few of you. All right, OK. So we just need to be careful on spoilers. Spoilers, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've got to say... Yes, some haven't, yes. Um, uh, we did one of these talks up at the National Theatre in London where the show started, and we had to do it as a streamed thing. And it's just so lovely to see real people with smiling faces. It, it just changes the tone. And we know we'll get some kind of bounce back and feedback, which is fantastic. So thank you again for being here in person. It's marvellous. So look, I thought we'd um, start off with just talking a little bit about verbatim theatre. Um, just, I'm, I'm going to assume that not everybody knows what verbatim theatre is. And then Alecky Blythe, our playwright, has a very particular take on verbatim theatre. So, Daniel, do you want to have a go at explaining? Yes, I will. So, um, Alecky Blythe has a technique that she calls recorded delivery. So, verbatim, I think, is a German word, isn't it? Yeah. Which means um, as spoken. Exactly. Yes. And... Um, and so no, what normally happens is that you just get, you know, people are interviewed and those actual words are then formed into the scenes and actors will read the words off a page and uh, act as per normal, you know, as if you were doing an Arthur Miller play or something. Alaki's technique is different because she interviews and on this show there are, I think, 600, over 650 hours of interviews which she then edits and distills down into scenes, and she crafts the scenes. And then the actors in the rehearsal room, there is no script. They listen, they get their words from the headphones. So they're listening to the actual dialogue, the words of the real people from the actual interviews. And Alaki's technique involves, I'm sure she wouldn't mind me, saying this, no, but, no, no. but her technique is particular for actors, and this was something that we had to really explore properly in the audition process. You, you, she, she asks that the volume is up nice and loud in, the, in your ears, obviously not ruining your hearing, but um, so that you can't hear your own voice. You can only hear the voice that you're listening to. And, so, and that's great, actually, for actors, because it means that actors don't have a chance to be self-conscious about their own voice, which often happens with actors. And the second thing is that you have to speak just a word or two after you hear the voice starting in your ear. You, you, the temptation is to sort of, once you've heard it a few times, to start speaking it at the same time. You'll trip yourself up. And also, if you, if you leave it too late before you start to speak, the brain will have forgotten what the start of the sentence. So it's quite a challenge for actors. It's a very, I think, a very interesting and pleasurable challenge, particularly for those actors who pick it up um, and who relish it. Um, so the actors weren't given a script. We had a nine-week rehearsal period, because obviously it's a lengthy play, and I think the actors were given this transcript in week seven. Yeah. 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 So up until this, they did four, six full weeks just with headphones in. And um, I have to say, I... I entered into this process when we started the development of this, well, I, when I joined the development, because it did started way before I, I was on board. But I entered into the process quite sceptical because, you know, having trained as an actor, and an actor, actors tend to pride themselves in their process and, you know, being able to kind of read this, the, the dialogue on the page and to be able to invent things, you know, oneself, one's own interpretation. And I thought, well, surely having the words and you have to imitate everything that you hear, that's very prescriptive. Where does the actor's craft come? And actually, by you know, the end of workshop one, actually by the end of day one, I'd realised that I was completely wrong, that what you hear is the tip of the iceberg, and you still have to put on your detective brain as an actor to find out, well, why is she going up in her voice at that point? Or why is she stumbling on that word? Or why is he getting emotional on that word and not that word? And, um, and those are all clues that then feed what's happening, you know, at the bottom part of the iceberg. And that's where the actor's technique kicks in. And um, so I've actually been a total convert to Alaki's technique. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's extraordinary uh, as well how it guides the actors, which oh, yeah. I, I, I sort of hadn't anticipated. And we'll talk a little bit, a little bit in a moment about um, where we got all the material from and the various people that we spoke to. Um, but just to jump forward a bit, just to, to, I suppose, demonstrate how effective this technique is, there's a, a, for those of you who have seen the play, you'll, you'll know the Kosovan family. Um, and uh, the Kosovan family, the real family, came to see the show and they met some of the actors afterwards. And they came with some friends. And our actress, Stephanie Street, who plays the mum, Lulietta, um, the friend came up to Steph and said, but it's extraordinary, you've got all her mannerisms. Did you, did you see a video of her? Or, or, you know, you're just so like her. It's extraordinary. And that was all from, from the audio. And sort of you don't realise how much it informs and instructs and guides. So if anything, it, it, it's, it's so much richer than just a text, really. And I think that's partly because it becomes less academic. Yeah. It's your, you know, the voices are in your ears and you are so concentrated on picking up every single bit of nuance that there is no time to think. I think that's what Alec is after, in a way. There's no time to get self-conscious, as I said, or even to be over-deliberate. You have to just go with what you're hearing. And often it reveals great spontaneity in actors. Great actors, are, they just, you just find that they... They respond in their bodies instinctively to what they're hearing in a way that, you know, I've, up till now, have not found with, with text written on a page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, and I think with text on a, on a page, you're always trying to read between the lines. Yeah, yeah, yes. Um, and yet it's... it's, it's Whereas that's not, your, that's not your duty when you're listening to it. You're just saying what you hear. Yeah, yeah. And it was a joyous moment in rehearsals when we took the headphones out because you know, there'd been a long period where yeah. actually they, they, they really couldn't hear, you know, all they could hear was in here. And, and then it, it, was, uh, it just really, really took off when they saw the joy of everyone else's um, kind of dedication and detail that they'd all learned through the headphones. So it, it is kind of extraordinary, really, what, what, it, had, what it has achieved. And, and uh, any of us who had kind of vague misgivings about it at the beginning, you know, it was completely put to bed and thought, no, actually, this is quite brilliant. Um, so we should talk a little bit about the content and where, where it all came from and, and kind of what the jumping off point was. Um, I don't know whether you want to or shall I begin that? Well, why don't you begin? Because you, you predate me on it. Because you, you... <laughs> Only a tiny bit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, Rufus Norris, artistic director of the, the National Theatre, um, had just been appointed and he was starting to begin conversations with various, various artists that he was excited about um, to see what they might create with him under his tenure. And he had worked with Alecky as a director, uh, as a freelance director, uh, on a piece called London Road um, back in about 2011, 2012, which had been a big success. So he was a big advocate of Alecky's work and her technique. And so he invited her in to have a chat about what she might do next. And he gave a very, very broad brief of, I want you to do something for, about young people, with young people. And that was about it. And um, we were coming up to the 800th anniversary of the Magna Carta. And uh, Alecky thought that could be a really interesting discussion point for, for youngsters and that we would go out to schools and see what the Magna Carta meant to a lot of young people. And uh, quite surprisingly, it meant nothing, really. <laughs> uh, and we thought, oh, OK, um, so what, what, what shall we do now? Um, but, but, but they were all so interesting, these kids, that um, I think Alecky got kind of drawn into um, just observing them. Uh, and so we did a, a few trial kind of runs in, in a couple of schools in, in Bristol, and she sat in the back of the room and just observed what was going on, what the chat was, the tea breaks, the lunch breaks. Um, and what was, what was hard, really, was trying to find kids who didn't want to be the same as everybody else. Because at that age, kind of 14, 15-year-old, you want to be part of the gang. You all wear the same kind of, you know, the guys are in tracky bottoms and, and the girls have nails and, you know, and they all look the same. So you, we were desperate to find the ones that were kind of original and different. And little by little, she started to identify, you know, the, 
the showman or the, 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 the one who's slightly isolated. Maybe she hasn't got all the games and tricks that uh, the, the cool gang have. And she thought, yeah, no, there's, there's mileage in this. Um, so she came back to Rufus and said, yeah, I, 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 I want to go with this. Uh, I'm not sure where it's going to land, um, whether there's er ever going to be a theatricality about it, a narrative arc, but will you allow me? Um, and thankfully, the National went, yeah, let's, let's go with this. So she assembled a group of um, collectors, um, so five young, young uh, theatre makers, um, and between them, they identified six areas across the UK where they would try and source interesting characters um, that we could follow over a period of time. And at the beginning, they, they uh, went to their various areas. So we were in London, Birmingham, uh, Cambridgeshire, um, North Wales, Belfast and Glasgow. So quite a, a widespread, quite a mixed demographic um, and uh, backgrounds and so on and so forth. So quite diverse, which was exciting. And um, they went initially twice a month and then it, it slid into about once a month because it was you know, quite a commitment for everyone to make. And uh, Alki and the five collectors would gather all the, this material, record it, distill it a little bit, and then Alki would work through some of the material and, and make choices over you know, what direction some of the questions might go so that... Um, maybe there were kind of themes that were starting to emerge that we would pursue a little bit further. And then we did a first workshop um, where we got introduced to some of the characters that people had been following to see whether they were interesting enough, whether there was a, a sort of a viability in the notion. And we got a, a kind of a semi-green light at that stage that, yeah, I think mm, it could work, but, you know, still not sure whether it's going to be a theatrical piece or whether it's actually more like a documentary and it'll be really good for Channel 4. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, that wasn't really where we wanted to go. I mean, Channel 4 is great, but, you know, we wanted to make theatre. Uh, and then uh, we had a conversation with Rufus about where do we go to find that theatricality? Where are our collaborators? We need to find a director who's going to craft this into something. Um, and thankfully... <laughs> Somebody had a really, really good idea. Um, OK, I'll be honest, it was me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to approach Daniel. And, um, and I set up, I sort of, it was a sort of a blind date. It was. Um, for Daniel and Alecky to meet. They didn't know each other. They knew of each other, but they, they didn't know each other. And I was like a very, very worried parent because <laughs> they went off to meet. And I thought they would meet, you know, for kind of about 45 minutes. And um, I heard nothing. I got no text saying, yeah, I'm home, I'm safe. It was all right. <laughs> and, um, well, I think then you should take over because you, you met. Yeah, we met in the, in the cafe at the Royal Opera House in Covent Garden. And um, I think we were there for the better part of two hours because once Alec had tr started to explain what the subject matter was and where she'd got to with it, it was immediately interesting to me. And she was describing, um, you know, the kinds of people. Actually, she described everyone in great detail, um, which was actually fascinating. But at that point, I still hadn't heard any material. So, and I still had this scepticism, which I didn't share with Alec at that point, because I thought, well, there's no point in doing that. I should just, you know, come with an open mind. And then we did have a fortnight at the National Theatre Studio, which is the... Um, the place where the National Theatre have like a lab for um, exploring and developing new plays. Oh, so we had a fortnight there with a small group of actors, about eight maybe, where we were just looking at six of the characters and just to explore. I mean, your task to me was to see whether there was any theatricality in this. Yeah. But it, 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 well, that wasn't hard for me because it, it's two reasons. One, because so as someone who loves language and is sort of obsessed with language, I immediately loved how people spoke. And for those of you who have seen the play, and indeed for those of you who will see the play, you will find that it's sometimes hard to believe that these lines are not written by a playwright. Or, or rather, maybe, um, how can I put it another way? With actors... And, um, and with playwrights, there are things in this play that I think they, they would, would not feel audacious enough to write. 
Real life is much more strange than playwrights would have you believe. And in our, in our real life, we use all kinds of parts of our voices that actors don't, wouldn't normally. I'm thinking about, for example, the, there's a scene in A Parent's Evening. I'm not going to give anything away, but there's a mother from Northern Ireland, and she, she's agreeing with a teacher who's saying, oh, the, the, the child is having some problems. And she says, um, oh, yeah, yeah, she's sloppy. Sloppy. Lazy. Sloppy. And, you know, I'm caricaturing slightly, but you've had an actress try and attempt that, and you'd say, well, I don't believe you, no one, no one would repeat it like that. But we have the, the audio evidence that this person does. And so when you hear it, it is, it is you recognise it instantly as having that kind of fresh air, or this kind of fresh wind of life about it. Yeah. That, and, you, that, and you don't doubt it for a second. You don't doubt it for a which second. Which is extraordinary, really. Yeah. No. Yeah. And so it brings out in a kind of audacity in actors, as well as, you know, um, obviously in Alecky's, in Alecky's forming of it all. Um, but, so that was one reason, language. Mm. And then the second reason was that it, um, the, the scenes themselves just immediately came to life for me. In my, when you listen to them, you could sort of see them. Whether that was, you know, a hip-hop group that the girl from Northern Ireland belongs to, and, you know, the, the collector there was able to go to the hip-hop uh, performance. And so it felt to me like, well, we should see that performance and we should have that dance. Um, there's a singing lesson in one of the public schools and, we, and the collector attends the singing lesson there. Well, we should hear that. There's an a cappella group and they, uh, there's a rehearsal of an a cappella group and the collector attends that. So immediately there were kind of innately theatrical situations that... Um, that felt not televisual. They felt theatrical to me. I and also you, you started to bring in one or two collaborators... Yes. ..to help you, uh, I suppose, test that, whether we could achieve that. Definitely. So Carrie-Anne Angrui is our uh, movement director. She's the choreographer of the, of the musical Six. She's been the resident choreographer in Hamilton for, you know, since it started in London. <laughs> so she kind of, you know, hip-hop and street dance is her yes. uh, native place you know, to be. So... Um, Yes, and, and, you know, there was music involved in those early... So it was it quit very, I think, very soon after that workshop, we felt like there was a play here. Yeah. Yeah, An definitely. unusual play. I don't think there is another play like it. Mm. And I think audiences, it takes a little while for audiences to tune into that and to realise, oh, yeah, this is a different kind of experience we're having. Because there's lots of direct address. The actors talk to the audience almost throughout. Um, you're, you're sort of... Because we interviewed everyone... Everything is from an interview. So you are like the interviewers throughout when they talk to you. Um, and you have to imagine sort of you're in the room with these real, real people and that you, you know, it's a wonderful feeling because it, it, it draws you in so quickly. It takes a little bit of adjusting to it maybe at the beginning. Mm, but, it does. But, but then it, it, it's, it's so engaging and it's, mm. it's so immediate, really. Um, and the, the other thing that... You know, always strikes me is, and, and Alec, he was very, very particular. You know, every cough, every stutter, every, um, it's all in there. And that's what sort of gives it its, its authenticity and that you actually really, really believe it. That kind of freshness. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was wonderful. So we, we, we after that workshop, then we felt we're in a really, really good place. Yeah, it was exciting. But yeah. there's still a hell of a journey to Well, we go. were only looking at six characters, and then the, the, the whole debate then was about how many characters could an audience take on. And there are 12 now. Well, Alecky had, had pursued 12 and was following 12. And then the next workshop was really about could the audience take on 12 characters and follow those storylines. But if you think about it, you know, if you think about a soap opera, or if you think about the dramas that we watch, you know, now in box sets or whatever, we're often used to following the main storyline, then the subplot, and then maybe the minor plot. And so it's no different to that in one sense, that your, you know, characters come in and out of, of uh, the evening, um, and you see their developments as they get older and, you know, reach age um, or creep towards their adulthood. Um, so that, that also then, I think, was um, another kind of obstacle that we got over. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think, this, for those of you who've seen it, I hope you feel this, that there's um, a real clarity in, in all those 12 characters, even though the 15 actors we have on stage play multiple parts and, and they turn on a sixpence. And it is quite extraordinary. But it, very quickly, you know who you're watching. Um, and, you know, and occasionally there's a, 
a teacher or a, uh, you know, a vicar, um, but y you know who he is, even though he's only there for, for two seconds. So it's really, really clear, clearly defined. And I mean, that's all credit to the actors as well. Oh, because immensely so. They are phenomenal. And we had actually, um, when, we were, <laughs> when we were up in London, we had two cases of COVID within the company. And um, bearing in mind that you know, it's very, very fast moving, over 200 scenes, um, multiple characters. We lose two actors. And two of the other actors extraordinarily take on the additional roles um, with uh, bare, a day. Yeah, uh, an afternoon. An afternoon of preparation. So I think Stephanie Street, who Parag mentioned, um, I think those performances, because they had to do that multiple times Indeed. because of COVID, the nature of COVID and needing to self isolate, um, I think she played 20 parts every night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and multiple accents, you know, it's, it, was, it was a feat. And Sarita um, Gabony, who also played two of the teenagers, um, her, her own character, which is uh, the character from North Wales, but then also... Um, yeah, so she played Robin. Robin from Scotland. Well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was amazing. And then all, the rest of the company, you know, picked up bits and, bit, uh, yeah. uh, bits and bobs, you know, in, ter in terms of moves on stage or... You know, there, there were a couple of moments where uh, Sarita should have been talking to Anna, who played Robin, yes. so she couldn't be talking to herself, you know, so, you know, but they were just brilliant. I mean, I did yeah. think, oh, it's great to be young, because you can do all <laughs> of that, you know, it's really, really, really impressive. Um, so, yeah, no, it's, it's been an extraordinary um, journey. You mentioned uh, just when you were talking about um, the, the, the process of, of making the piece, um, we, we had 656 hours and 19 minutes of material that we had to distill into what is now, excluding the intervals, it's about just over three hours. Yeah. Um, and uh, again, what, what was the process of that like? Because, you know, there was so, I mean, Alaki is extraordinary. I, I did ask her, I said, you know, how, how do you retain all this material and then decide um, what you're going to jettison and what's, you know, what is worthy of staying within the play. And she said something like, oh, well, about 400 hours of it is, is actually quite dull. So that was easy to cut. But you still got kind of 200 hours to get down in, in, into three hours. And, I mean, you were a massive part of that. You and Alaki and uh, Sebastian Bourne, who was our dramaturg. Uh, and, I mean, you were forensic. Really, I, well, it's Alecky, really, and and um, Bash, Sebastian Bourne. Their ability to be able to hold so much information in in their heads at once was really awesome. Mm -hmm. In that it induced awe in me. Um, Alecky, I don't know how she does it, but she must she must make notes and she must have an index or something <laughs> that she goes to secretly because something would come up in a scene and she, and she, you could see a kind of light, light bulb go on and she'd say, oh, hang on, let me just go into my hard drive and, then, and she'd bring out a scene and say, ah, this connects very well with that and we'd put these together. So, you know, for, for people, um, where, you know, for those who've seen it and those who will and people who've seen it multiple times say, some people have come back to see it over and over and said, um, Gosh, I can really see Alecky's craft in, in not just, there are, th there are moments where we um, riff on a theme. So, for example, um, self-image. So how, how the teenagers feel about themselves, how they look, which is obviously a big deal for, for teenagers because of all kinds of pressures on them, from, not least from social media or peers. Um, and Alecky is then able to kind of go through all of the characters and go, what are, they, what are the moments that they, where they talk about themselves and how they feel about their bodies? And she puts all those together. And um, she, so she does it there, but she might also, for example, there's a whole sequence where um, people come into the sixth form and then there's the possibility of uh, applying to be head boy or head girl. And she, so she immediately then put, you know, gets, gets the, the, all of the sequences together where that occurs. So you can just see the kind of development chronological in people's, chronologically in people's lives. And I, I really actually don't know how she has that kind of Rolodex mind where she can draw things. She, she must be able to hold all of the information at once, which I, I couldn't do. Yeah, it, it is extraordinary. And... and you know, it, it's partly unifying of, you know, the experience of young people because you think, you know, they're all over the country and yet they're grappling with the same sort of things. But it also brings a great humour to it as well because she 
cleverly, the three of you cleverly juxtapose certain things and it's dif different perspectives on exactly the same. Uh, and it, it, it's a wonderfully funny moment. I didn't anticipate it being so joyously funny and poignant as well um, at, at the early stage. But, you know, young people are funny, even though they're grappling with really, really hard stuff at times. Um, but it does make you laugh. It does remind you of yourself when, you, you know, many, many years ago when I was a teenager and, you know, what I was kind of going through. And that in itself is, is, is um, kind of very rewarding and also, um, you know, uh, makes you think, thank God I'm not 18 anymore. <laughs> Um, but talking about, uh, about you know, what you get out of it, what would you say you want our audiences to, to come away with from the experience of seeing our, our generation? Well, in one sense, it's what I believe passionately that theatre can do per se, which is, you know, to quote Shakespeare, to hold a mirror up to nature. So it's something about recognising um, ourselves and each other and deepening our understanding of ourselves and each other through watching stories about other people's lives. So there's that, and I think that does happen. You know, as you said, it, it reminds you of your own teenage, but you know, parents have come, teachers have come, grandparents have come and said, oh God, this character's just like my, my grandson. Or, um, or, or you know, someone came and said, a parent came and said, um, my daughter's about three of the characters, you know, mi mixed, mixed together. And so, you know, there's, there's yeah. that. Um, teenagers come and feel like the stories, that they see themselves on stage. And I think that's very valuable. I find that very moving and valuable because often teenage roles are written by adults. And so to have teenage voices represented so authentically, I think must mean something to teenagers themselves. And we've had that feedback from a lot of youngsters, you know, yeah. in their teens or in their 20s, who maybe think, oh God, theatre is, is dull or, you know, it's for old people. And then they come in and they see themselves on stage and yeah. it hasn't been filtered at all. Yes. It's pure. And I think that, that's really exciting. And I mean, it's been wonderful watching right through the run in London and, and, and the shows here in Chichester, uh, the mix of audience and, and seeing the, the kids leaning forward, laughing, recognising, and then jumping on their feet at the end, mm. you know. Yeah. Um, and, and it may, may not be their, you know, their normal habitat, but they feel actually at home because it's, they feel it is their place in, the, in this particular production, which is, yeah. which is tremendous. I think as well, I had quite a robust conversation with someone last night who, um, who said... Oh, I, I couldn't stand them. And I said, <laughs> what, any of them? No, no, no. I mean, I, I, when I was 14, I, you know, I coped. I could cope with anything. You know, I didn't blame my parents like this lot are doing. And I thought, oh, I felt sorry for him because I thought one of the things that I would love audiences to take away is I, 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 I find a great sense of hope in this lot. You, you see them go through immense challenges. I'm thinking of um, the, the young woman from North Wales who, whatever you know, happened to her in, her in her younger childhood, her father um, has, is in and out of prison, and so he's absent. And she goes from a, a, a boyfriend to boyfriend who is pretty abusive towards her. Um, and I say those things because probably, you know, a psychoanalyst would have a field day, you know, and what, what's happening there with what, you know, maybe she's, you know, searching for her father or whatever. But, um, but eventually at the end of the play, and she goes through a pretty rough time, she has, she, she, she tells us eventually, oh no, I won't say that. I won't say one crucial bit, but she, she goes through a rough time. And, and actually in the play, she only shares half of what she actually went through, the real person. And at the end of the play, um, something happens to her and she talks about how she feels like she's come through and how she feels like she's found resilience within herself. And I find that really moving as someone who comes from, you know, a part of North Wales where there's, it's very, there's lots of deprivation economically there. I know where she comes from, even though I'm from the other side of the country. And it's pretty poor. And then to hear her at the end of the play, after everything she's gone through, find that she can stand up and in her own voice 
And, you know, that, I find that very, very hopeful. Yeah, there's real optimism. Right there's there. so much optimism. Yeah. And, and, you know, the young people often get a bad rap. Um, and in the play, sometimes old people get a bad rap. Um, you know, and there's, and that, yes, I know, it's challenging. Um, but, but, you know, there's a thing that I think we are trying in our public debate now to try and find a space where we can come together more. And that's something that the theatre does better than anything, is that we come together to hear stories and through those stories, try and understand what it's like for one another. And I think if we can try and understand what young people are going through, you know, they feel so passionately about climate change because they'll be the ones around to deal with the consequences of what our generation is doing to the planet. Um, and so we, we really have to think about them and, and what our children and their children and their children will be dealing with as we try to, you know, conscientiously live the rest of our lives. And I, and I think that's what Alaki has keyed into in a, in a profound, moving, amazing way. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I mean, we go, uh, as an audience, we go on an incredible journey, uh, but, but I think it's that reflecting afterwards um, uh, of what they've gone through and how that impacts on us now, today, in our real lives, how we deal with our kids or our grandkids <laughs> yes. or whatever. Uh, and that's, that's yes. wonderful, yes. really, because it, it's kind of provocative. Yes. Um, and, and that we don't have all the answers, actually. Yes. Um, that, that sometimes um, that, that kind of youthful... From the mouths of babes. Well, exactly, exactly. Um, Some parents have come and said, um, <laughs> said to me, friends of mine, because I don't have children, unfortunately, but um, some of friends who are parents said, um, oh, God, I think I'm like that mother, you know. <laughs> and um, I, must, I must try and not do that, you know. <laughs> and so there is a sense that there is a bit of, um, you know, someone else said to me, God, my, my friend's having, you know, lots of trouble with their kids at the moment. I'm going to buy them tickets, right. you know. <laughs> so, like, they're talking about sending them to therapy. Oh, no, forget therapy. Come and see the play, you know. <laughs> Well, I had a very happy moment because one of my kids said, actually, Dad, you're not bad. <laughs> oh, how lovely. <laughs> so I thought that was a big win. Oh. <laughs>